If you have a Bible, I'm going to be in Genesis 1 and 3. When I was growing up in New York, my father would always tell me I was Puerto Rican and that I was adopted from a family in Puerto Rico. Now, I'm not adopted from Puerto Rico, and I'm not even Puerto Rican. <laughs> my father's from Jamaica. He's kind of, you know, a darker brown. My mother is, has a, a, a white mo- My mother has a white mother, had a white mother and a, and a black father that got married, like, literally about 100 years ago. No, literally, because, you know, there was long, so that was, like, ridiculously controversial. So I came out this nice Cafe Coco Brown. <laughs> Go figure. So... My father used to tell me, oh, you're Puerto Rican, because if you go to New York, you know, I just, I look Hispanic. Anybody here Hispanic? Okay, do I look Hispanic? So I had these ladies that are like, hey, papi, hey, papi, papi, hey, papi, hey, minute, minute, minute. So I grew up, like, thinking, okay, I, maybe I'm Hispanic, so maybe I got to get a, a, a Puerto Rican woman. So the, my whole life growing up, I'm looking for this Puerto Rican wife. No lie. But I can never speak Spanish. So when I got older, I said, you know what, I got a church that's, you know, 30% Hispanic. I live in Mexico. I mean, I live in Tijuana. I mean, I live in San Diego. It's right next to Tijuana. <laughs> Not for real. It's, 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 I wasn't really, it was just kind of true. So we, uh, it's about 30% Hispanic, our church. So I figured I'm going to learn Spanish. So I go to, last year I went to uh, Costa Rica. I was there for two weeks, dos semanas, learning Spanish. And I'm asking, how do you say this? How do you say that? And I say, okay, how do you say boyfriend? And they, anybody in one? <laughs> oh, you got a lot of Hispanics in here. <laughs> I better be careful. I better say novio. Everyone say novio. And then girlfriend is with an A, novia, novia. I was like, oh, that's cool. Okay, novio. No, I'm trying to get into my head. You know, and then they say, oh, but there's, a, there's another phrase. Otro frase. It's uh, amigo con derechos. <laughs> amigo con derechos. I'm like, amigo con derechos? Okay, amigo is friend. Con is with derechos. Rights. A friend with rights. Or a friend with benefits. Okay. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to process in my mind. I'm like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> so basically, you got this area on Monday. You have this area on Tuesday. And you can have all on Friday. So you have different friends and they have different rights over different parts of your body or your life at different times of the week. You have a friend with benefits. Or do you get what I'm saying? And so I'm trying to process, I said, man, that's, that's not really good. And there are a lot of people who, when they accept Christ, you have an amigo con derechos relationship with Jesus. You're not, f- f- you're not 100% committed. See, when, you're at, when you give your life to Christ, in theory, you get married. And in theory, when you give your life to Christ, you're saying, Lord, I am all yours. The songs we just sang, okay, some of us sing lies to God every Sunday because we're not committed. We, we, in other words, he's an amigo con derechos. He's a friend with rights. He has rights over Sunday or when we come to conference. He has rights over Bible study. He has rights over our small group. He has rights over our prayer meeting. But he doesn't have rights when we go out to the club. He doesn't have rights when we turn on the pornography on our screen and we get drunk we yell at our wife or husband or beat our kids. He doesn't have rights over those times. He only has rights on certain days at the times of the week. So we have an amigo con derechos. We're cheating on him all the time. We're basically an adulterer, adulteress. Now, the bad, that's not even the bad news, by the way. That's not the bad news. It gets a lot worse than that. Because if you have an amigo con derechos relationship with Jesus, by default, you also have an amigo con derechos relationship with the Satan. That means you have said to God, God, I trust you, but not with this area of my life. So by default, I'm going to trust the devil with this area of my life. Who? This is going to get scary. Because my, my bet is that every person listening to my voice, including myself, we have an amigo con derechos relationship with the devil. He has told you something that you believed and you've taken his advice and it has consequences. So today, my, my challenge is to one, to convince you that you have it. Because some of you are like, who does he think he is? Tell me I got a relationship with the devil. I don't like, I, I tweeted out one day, what's your relationship with the devil? And someone said, I don't have one. I said, oh, he's got you fooled. You are his sucker. That's what you are. Because in the least, the devil has to be your enemy. You can't not have a relationship with him. In the least, he has to be your enemy. So you have to acknowledge where he's at. You know, the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. But if you don't acknowledge that he's in your life, you can't resist him. He's not going to flee. You can pray all you want. He's right here. I, I, I I wrote a novel. I have this idea for four novels, by the way. And I wrote one and no one wants to publish it. So I'm going to publish it myself. It's a fabulous story. 
It's about a guy that goes to heaven, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that because I don't want you to steal my idea. But the second novel that I started is about a guy who dies and goes to hell. So one's about heaven, one's about hell, and the third one's about he heaven again. And then the fourth one has nothing to do with the first three. But the, but the second one's about hell, and the guy dies and goes to hell. He's in the, out, he's in the ambulance, and the de he's in the ambulance dying. He's a kid overdose. And the demons are trying to kill him in the ambulance, and the angel is protecting him in the ambulance, saying, pray to ask Jesus into your heart. And the demons are trying to kill him before he gets saved. And the kid's in the ambulance and he's screaming out to God. He dies and goes to hell. He's in hell burning up and he hears these two demons over here laughing at him. And one demon says to the other demon, he never prayed. And the kid says, I prayed, I prayed. And the demon comes in his face and says, you didn't pray to anyone we have to listen to. You better make sure who you're praying to. You have a amigo called the just relationship with the devil. Genesis chapter 1, let's start with the beginning. I'll start with the good news. And by the way, at the end of the message, you're going to have to decide to tear up your contract. Because all of you have a contract. It's not a big contract, by the way. It's very small, but it's very powerful. You have to identify, and if you're taking notes, I want you to identify what your contract is. Because you have an agreement with the devil. You have made a deal with him. And you need to identify what it is. If you never identify what it is, it will never go away. And you can pray all you want. You can get all the therapy you want. He'll just laugh at you. So good news. Let's talk about the good news. Anyone say good news? The good news is that you were made in the image of God. Let's read Genesis chapter 1. This is the good news. It don't last too long, but we're going to say it anyway. Genesis chapter 1, it says, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. Everyone say dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creep that creeps on the ground. Now, these creeps are not only bugs, they could be people. <laughs> now, nah, these are really just bugs, okay? These are just bugs. <laughs> you ain't met my husband, okay? Okay. <laughs> Verse 27, so God created him, man, in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the bird, of fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the ground. The good news is that you and I were made in the image of God. Every single human being was made in the image of God. I wrote a book called God in the Mirror, and we spell out the word image, I-M-A-G-E. I, you were made individually unique. There is nobody like you. You are marvelous. Like you went to Harvard. There was no one like you, no one with your eye, no one with your, head, your, your, your DNA, your fingerprint, your toe print, your eye print, your vein pattern in your eye. I can go on and on. The thousands of unique things about you, and God made you to stand out, yet the world wants you to try to fit in. You're one of a kind. You're individually unique. Number two, you're a moral mirror. You and I were made like no other creature and no other thing on the earth to be able to be a moral mirror of God's righteousness. We can understand it. We can teach it. We can talk about it. We can learn it. We can interact with it. And we can share it with other people. A, you have been given the authority to rule, not over people. That's slavery. You've been given the authority to rule over environments. Pastor Robert's responsibility is the environment of this room, of this church. So when you walk into the environment, Pastor Mark talked about an open heaven. You walk into the environment, you walk into heaven. God says, I've given you, Pastor Robert, the authority over this environment. So when people walk into the environment, they meet me. I have a grandchild, my grandson. He's the smoothest brother on the planet. <laughs> Seven months old. He is going to date Pastor Robert's granddaughter. <laughs> we just let's, let's skip all the drama. Okay, he's going to be a pastor. He, you know, we'll hook it all up. Uh, my son's responsibility is to create an environment in the room where he lives, so he will grow up to be what God wants him to be and what his grandfather wants him to be. Because he doesn't belong to my son. He doesn't belong to my daughter-in-law. He belongs to God. His authority is over his environment, not his future. God says, I've given you dominion. He goes, Adam and Eve, I've given you dominion over the earth. Adam and Eve, you, think about this, you have dominion, authority over the earth. And I'm giving you the responsibility to subdue it. This is in the beginning. God created us to, ha to have that responsibility. Uh, I am a G. G, God created us to be his friend, to walk in relationship. Your number one purpose that God made you is to have relationship. We don't have, God didn't make us to worship him. He already was being worshipped. You don't have babies to worship you. 
You have babies to love. God said, I'm going to make you to love. And the E is that you're eternal. You're never going to die. I do, you know, we do a few do funerals of Christians and non-Christians. Never been to a funeral where, everyone, where they didn't say at the end, oh, he's in a better place. Even non-Christians, oh, he's in a better place. Because God has put eternity in us. And they always look up. He's in a better place. I've never seen anybody go, well, he's, I don't know. <laughs> Because they don't want to believe that because they know, hey, maybe it's possible even though I don't believe in God. Because God has put eternity in us. God has made you in his image. That was his original intent. You are marvelous, fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the good news. The bad news is that you took all of that responsibility and you made a deal with the devil. The devil came along and said, I got something better. And you went, I'm listening. And every day you have that conversation with him. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of field which the Lord God had made. Let's stop right there. This is the devil. Let me tell you his names. Uh, evil one, destroyer, murderer, liar, father of lies. That's his name. Now, some people might not believe in the devil. They saw some of you as in they saw may not believe in the devil. The devil is intelligent evil, strategic evil, planned evil. I was in the movie theater. In our church, if I say who's the man, we all say Jesus. Y'all, y'all, some of y'all remember or Some of y'all know. Okay, let's try it because I need y'all, y'all need to know this for when you go to heaven. <laughs> I'm going to say who's the man. Y'all going to say Jesus, but you got to say it with a dip. Okay, you don't have to dip. I'll dip. But it's got a dip right here. (laughs) Jesus, like that. Okay. Who's the man? Jesus. Very good. See, when you get to heaven, the Rock Church, we are going to have our own section. (laughs) And you will hear, Jesus, Jesus. You can come. Say you're from Gateway. You can come for a while. But then you have to go. (laughs) It's this little thing me, me and God got worked out. I was in a movie theater, sitting in the back of the movie theater, and they were doing the Exorcist movie. You ever see the Exorcist movies? How many of y'all remember the, oh, the original Linda Blair Exorcist guacamole movie? <laughs> that bad boy was scary. My brother and I slept back to back in the bed for like a week. <laughs> I, I said, Mark, Mark. He said, what? I went, ah. <laughs> so now they're on Exodus 13 or something. I don't know how many Exodus. They, you cannot top the first one. They got, it's, it's fake scariness now. The girl, you know, crawling on the ceiling backwards and her head's going around and stuff. So we're in that movie and, and we're, I mean, sorry, we're in the movie and we're sitting in the back. We always sit, I like to sit way in the back in the middle. And they showed the preview to the next Exodus movie. It was like Exodus number 49. And right at the end of the movie, it was like some werewolf scrum. <laughs> and then the movie went silent. And everybody's in there like just scared. Grown adults holding each other's hands. And someone in the front of the, the theater said, Jesus. <laughs> and I'm in the back. I said, who's the man? They said, Jesus. <laughs> and everybody started doing that. Because people in the movie knew that was evil. That was evil. And somebody needs to say something good. <laughs> Satan is real. He's intelligent. He understands you. And his most masterful trick is to convince you he's not real. Because you'll never fight him. you never pray against him. You'll just take medicine. You'll get therapy. Nothing wrong with medicine. Nothing wrong with therapy. I do both. <laughs> I went to a doctor last, last year to get diagnosed for ADD. Really, I did. I went, I, you know, I, I went and they, they, he said, oh, yes, you have ADD. I said, Debbie, I told my wife, you have a, I have ADD. She's like, oh, you, you paid for that diagnosis? <laughs> I could have told you that. <laughs> the servant was more cunning than any beast to feel the Lord God had made. Why is it so smart to know he's cunning? Because he is smarter than you. You need to know that. He's smarter than you. He's smarter than you think he is. Oh, well, I got Jesus. Yeah, he's not, smart. he's not smarter than Jesus, but you ain't Jesus. <laughs> and he said to the woman... Yo, girl, what's your name? (laughs) 
Y'all you know, making me laugh. Y'all making me laugh. It's serious. It's church. Be quiet. He said, uh, uh, where's your man at? I don't know. He's over there walking around with some animals or something. I don't know. He said, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat nor shall you touch lest you die. The servant said, God lied to you. I got something better. Now, she has dominion with Adam over the whole earth. God gave her and Adam dominion over the whole earth. And God told them, subdue it, including this fool. Subdue him. He comes along. He knows he cannot take that authority. He cannot make her trust him. He can only deceive her. So the woman says, you won't die. With every negotiation, there's always price and terms. I'm going to make a deal with you. You could be like God. God lied to you. For God knows in the day you eat, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her man, and that knucklehead ate. <laughs> and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Number well, one, don't ever talk with the devil. Ladies, if you're ever in the store, Starbucks, Vons, whatever stores y'all got out here, y'all got Vons? Y'all got Trader Joe's? Okay, hey, Whole Foods, whatever you go. You ever walk in Trader Joe's trying to be all cute and you're single and some guy comes to you and says, hey, girl, what's your name? And you go, my name is Betty Joe because you're from Dallas. That was funny, okay? <laughs> and then he says to you when you ask him his name, what's your name? He says, my name is Player. What do you do? Forrest Gump, run. <laughs> you don't want to talk with the devil, but here's what the devil says. The devil says, God lied to you. I have a better deal. God has said to you, are you going to give your life to me? You say yes, and, but you said no, but I'm going to make a deal with the devil. When you make a deal with the devil, what you are doing is you are submitting yourself into his care. Let me back up. Back up. Jesus, my life is a mess. I can't handle it. I don't know. I'm, I'm suicidal. I'm addicted. I'm lost. My husband's leaving me. I got all the drama. I can't take it. I can't take it. I give my life to you in theory. Please save my soul, which he does. Please fill me with joy and purpose, and I'll trust you with all my heart. But you're lying because you have a side deal. You have this little contract over here with the devil saying, I'll give you my heart, but not on Tuesday because that's the night I go to the club. Not at 5 o'clock in the morning. That's when I watch my pornography. Pornography is watched more on Sunday than any other day of the week. Not downtown. That's why I got my girlfriend Honey's in the hot tub. I can't get that up. But, I, Lord, I love you. I love you. And God says, I'm going to take you, but I know about your side deal. And what you're telling the devil is, devil, price and terms. I, I trusted Jesus with all my heart, but I don't trust Jesus could take care of this part of my life. I'm going to entrust the devil for that part. The devil has told some of you you're fat and ugly, and you said, you're right. You just made a deal with the devil. You just took him at his word and you believed him instead of, instead of God telling you, you're just big boned and I love you beautifully. <laughs> you're too skinny. You're just slim and svelte. <laughs> the devil's going to tell you you're dumb and you're going to believe him. The devil's going to tell you you're fat. You're going to believe him. The devil's going to tell you you're not lovable and you're going to believe him. The devil's going to tell you through your daddy that you're never going to be anything, and you carry that your whole life, and the devil had, and you have believed him, and you've held on to that as truth when it is a lie. You made a deal with the devil. You blame your daddy. You can blame your neighborhood. You can blame TV. You can blame all this stuff, and the devil's sitting in the background, and he's got you by the neck like this, and you never pray against him. 
And when you make a deal with the devil, you, pre- you, you submit yourself into his care. If you're an alcoholic and you go to the bar or into your basement and you take that bottle and you drink that bottle, what you're telling the bottle really to the devil is that I trust you to make me happy. Medicate my pain. I'm not trusting prayer. I'm not trusting the word. I'm not trusting fellowship. I'm not trusting confession. I'm not trusting submission. I'm trusting the bottle. So take care of me. Make me feel good. Make me feel loved. Whatever it is that you're doing to do what God promised he would do, you are placing yourself into that care. And therefore, you are giving the devil, you ain't going to like this, you are giving the devil legal jurisdiction over your life. Oh, you are telling the devil, I give you permission to do with me whatever you want. You don't think God would give you legal jurisdiction? You want to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Paul says, if there's a person sinning in your midst and they don't repent, turn them over to Satan. Let the devil deal with them. The devil will treat them so bad, hopefully they'll come running back. Mm Mm-hmm. You don't think that's true? But what are we, oh, it's okay, pookie, pookie, it's okay. No, it ain't. What did did God tell the devil with Job? He said, Satan, you can touch everything he has, don't touch his body. The devil had legal jurisdiction, but he couldn't touch his body the first time. And and the devil told God, if I I take everything he has and all his money, he's going to curse you to your face. And God said, no, he won't because that guy is not going to make a deal with you. I have his whole heart. He is not an adulterer. He is faithful to me. So no matter what you do, he will not make a deal with you. And the devil said, I bet you he makes a deal with me and curses to your face. And the devil took everything he had except his body. He didn't touch his body. Why? Because that's the only jurisdiction he was given the first time. And then the devil said, oh, I bet you if I touch his body, Job chapter 2, he'll curse you to your face. And God said, nope. Job is a faithful man, blameless. He will not make a deal with you because he's that strong. He had boils all over his face, all over his body, scraping his body. And his wife said, curse God and die. She had to deal with the devil. Homegirl was a (laughs) she-devil. He said, you speak like a foolish woman. God is looking for people who will tear that contract up. But you first have to understand what contract you have and where it is and what it's doing to you. Because if, you, if, you're making, if you made a deal with the devil for cocaine, he's going to pay you with death. He's promising to bless you. Look what he said to Eve and Adam. He said to Eve and Adam in verse 5, For God knows in the day you eat, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked and sewed themselves fig leaves to make themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God of, uh, uh, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees. Um, can you hide your thoughts from God? Uh, let me ask you this. You can say yes or no. There's, there's two two answers, and, and, and I want you to say it loud. Can you hide your thoughts from God? Can you hide your intentions from God? Can you hide your actions from God? So why every day do you try? You act like God can't see you. If you're hiding from God, that means you're doing something God doesn't want you to do. But you can't hide anything from God. He sees everything. He knows everything. My, when my son was born, I had three kids, uh, two girls and a boy. My son is the youngest. My wife was in labor 12 hours with our first child, 24 hours with our second child. 49 hours with my son, his head was stuck five hours to come out. Hmm. His head, a normal kid's baby's head is about 30% of the weight. My son's head was like 47% of his weight, like National Geographic size. (laughs) So we play hide and seek in the house. We play hide and seek. You know, we we turn all the lights off in the house. We turn all the lights off in the house, and then you got to scare the person coming to look for you. So he said, Dad, I won't play hide and seek. I'm, brother, where are you going to hide? Your head is like this big. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm going to count. You go hide. I count. I can hear him walking through the hall because his head is banging on the hallway as he's walking through the hallway. And then when he goes through the doorway, you know, the doorway is a little more narrow than the hall. It goes right through the hallway, right through the doorway. The brother hides behind a plant like this big. So there's like four feet of skull over here and four feet of skull over here. And I can hear him go, he can't see us. His sister is hiding behind his head. (laughs) 
The reason he doesn't think I can see him is because he can't see me. Because little, little kids can't think abstractly. They can't see it. It's not there. We know there are things we can't see that are there. The devil will constantly tell you, God doesn't see you. He doesn't know what you do. And by the way, I don't even exist. So you walk around with this demonic influence. You, know, you may not be demon-possessed, but those brothers will get on you. You ever have thoughts in your head? You're like, where did that thought come from? Hmm, spiritual. Addictions, you can't fight. You pray, you read your Bible. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. But if you don't resist him with the name and authority that Jesus Christ won on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he says all authority. Matter of fact, before that, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, the devil said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world because they've been delivered to me. When were they delivered to him? When Adam and Eve made the deal. They told the devil, devil, we're going to do things your way. So here's the contract. Here's all our authority. You give us our power. And they got duped. Jesus said, the second Adam is going to do what the first Adam should have done. He died on the cross and he says, thank you very much. All authority is now mine. And I'm going to give it to you back so you can do what you should have done the first time. But if you don't use that authority against the devil, he will have authority over you. Oh, he'll let you come to church. He'll let you carry your Bible. He'll let you say praise the Lord. And he will let you curse up a storm so people see what kind of hypocrite you are and never go to Christ. He'll give you enough religion, enough God, enough Christianity to make you feel legit, but enough garbage to disqualify you. And he is so smart. But you have a deal. you got to break the deal. You have to acknowledge, I've been trusting a lie. Think about the lies that you've been relying on and believing and repeating to yourself. I'm never going to be. I'm not this. I won't be this. The lies that you are believing in your head. 50, 60, 70 to the day you die, you will take those lies to your grave. Unless you say in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. I have all authority in heaven and earth. I sit at the right hand of the Father with Christ. In Christ, he's given me all the authority in heaven and earth. I need to apply that against this fool who has been deceiving me and holding me back. you got to deal with the devil. And so in a minute, we're going to pray. And here's your opportunity to say, Lord, Jesus, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to acknowledge all these deals I made. Some of y'all got a bunch of them. And some of you just have one. A little voice you heard. I spoke to a young lady the other day. Beautiful young lady. She has lies that she's believing. I said, when did you realize you had these lies? Was this, did something happen to you? She said, the second grade. She's 30-something. I said, the second grade? Yes, the second grade. They said this to me. The second grade. What is that, seven? We're talking 30 years ago? At some point, you got to call it what it is. In Jesus' name, I take authority over any demonic influence in my life, any spirit of fear in my life, spirit of infirmity in my life, and I command you out of my life. I acknowledge that you are there and that you are real. And by the way, in every single day, we're going to fight. Every single day. But I tell you, before I get up, I, uh, uh, I when. Uh, huh? They start helping me now. Frisco and North Fort Worth. <laughs> you can't say that fast unless you're from Texas. <laughs> and I'm not. So I love going to bed at night. It's my favorite time of the day. I hug my pillow more than my wife. Every night for eight hours, seven hours. And I have a theory about sleep. Sleep, dreams, nightmares, and waking up is life, death, and eternity rehearsed every day. When you're awake, you're alive. When you die, you go to sleep. And when you're asleep, you go to a place that's like reality but different. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's a dream and sometimes it's a nightmare. And then you resurrect and start over. And every day you live, you die, and you go someplace and then you live, you die, and then you go someplace. And God is trying to tell you there's two places. You don't want to go to the bad place. 
Are you following me? And then when you, when you sleep, you have a thing called rapid eye movement. And when you're a rapid eye movement, you have a thing called, um, uh, oh, what's it called? It's, it's, it's something paralysis. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to name it, but it, you, your body is paralyzed when you're dreaming. You can't move when you're dreaming. You know why? God made it that way so you wouldn't live out your dream. Praise the Lord. But sometimes when you wake up during your dream and you're half awake and half asleep and you think someone's in a room and you can't move, you ever been there? You're like, uh, uh, and you think someone's right here and you're like, uh, and you can't, you can't, you can't say anything, you can't get up, and you're like, uh, and you can't go back to sleep. I can't remember why I brought up the sleep part. <laughs> oh, I got it. I remembered. Thank you. Whenever I go to sleep, as soon as I wake up, before I open my eyes, because you wake up before you open your eyes. Think about it. You're asleep, and you're having a dream because you dream right when you go to sleep, and you dream right before you wake up. So right before you wake up, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're doing whatever you didn't dream. And then, you, and then you go, oh, and then you wake up. And right before you open your eyes, this is how it goes. You go, oh, I'm awake. And then you go. <laughs> at that moment, at that moment, Lord, in Jesus' name, I rebuke any unclean spirit in my life. In Jesus' name, Jesus, you have all authority in heaven and earth. And right now, I surrender my day to you. Holy Spirit, go before me. Camp your angels all around me. Demonic influence, be gone. I command you. Be gone. I'm not asking. I'm not suggesting. This is not an idea. I command you. So right now, in Frisco, in North Fort Worth, <laughs> Daystar audience, online audience, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to picture your contract. If there was a piece of paper with your signature on the bottom and Satan's signature right next to yours, and the content of the contract were the lies that you believe. Anything about your life, your future, your present, your past that is not biblical is on that contract. And what comes with those lies are consequences. With every contract, there's price and terms. The price is your freedom, your peace, your happiness. The terms are all the lies you believe. All the ways you compromise your faith, cut corners in your faith, trust the devil over God, trust your friends over God, trust gossip radio over God, trust politics over God. Those are all the lies, and they all have consequences. And at some point, you need to acknowledge that the spirit behind those lies is demonic, and that you have no authority in yourself over that spirit. He will not go anywhere unless you exercise the authority from heaven that Christ got on the cross and rose from the dead, that he secured all authority, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Satan has none except what you give him. Gateway, Satan has none over your life except what you give him. Frisco. North Fort Worth. Daystar online. Satan has no authority except what you give him. Of course you wouldn't do that knowingly, but now you know. So you can take it back. So I'm going to ask you all, everywhere in all the campuses, online, Daystar audience, I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of faith against the evil one in your life. It's a prayer of submission to Christ 100%. No more amigo con derechos. He is 
the husband of the church. And you are 100% faithful to him. That's what he requires. That's what he deserves. So in the privacy of your heart, I want you to pray this to him. You don't need to pray it out loud. Pray it in your spirit. Pray, dear God, Jesus, I surrender my whole heart to you. 100% of my allegiance to my Savior, Jesus. Cleanse me of my sin. Fill me with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. El Espíritu Santo, llena mi corazón, fill my heart, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I command all demonic influence out of my life. In Jesus' name, I command the spirit of fear out of my life, the spirit of greed out of my life. Every unclean spirit be gone. In Jesus' name, I cancel all agreements with the evil one. I tear up the contract. I tear up the contract. I trust you no more. Lord God, I pray for supernatural deliverance and freedom. I pray people would be honest and acknowledge those contracts, those agreements, and in Jesus' name, they would rebuke Satan out of their life. And they would claim God's promises to be eternally true, eternally secure, life transforming. And we pray that the old would be truly gone and the new would come. And it's in Jesus' name, in the nombre de Jesus, we pray. Amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.